If you're a small business owner looking to grow or expand your business, check out OnDeck Business Loans. OnDeck offers business loans online from $5,000 to $500,000, and their simple application process only takes 10 minutes. Unlike banks, they'll give you a decision quickly, and funding is as fast as one day. Get a free consultation with an OnDeck loan advisor. Visit ondeck.com slash podcast. The key to sustainable leadership lies in the ability to thrive in uncertainty, ambiguity, and change. Grand Heron International brings you the Coaching Assistance Program, giving your employees on-demand coaching to manage through a challenging situation and arrive at a solution. Visit grandheroninternational.ca slash podcast to learn more. For more than 20 years, Imagineer has been committed to transforming the way investor relations and fund marketing teams at investment management firms engage with and service their clients. Visit learn.imagineertechnology.com slash keep leading to learn more. This podcast is part of the C-Suite Radio Network, turning the volume up on business. Welcome to the Keep Leading Podcast, a podcast dedicated to promoting leadership development and sharing leadership insights. Here's your host, the Leadership Accelerator, Eddie Turner. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Keep Leading Podcast the podcast dedicated to leadership development and insights. I'm your host, Eddie Turner, the Leadership Accelerator. I work with leaders to accelerate performance and drive impact. On the Keep Leading Podcast, I talk about leadership from many different aspects. Today, I'd like to talk to someone who is leading at the highest level. I will interview Jeremy Bacon. He's the CEO of the Imagineer Technology Group and the chairman of the Illinois Technology Association. He's been featured in Fast Company, Crane's Chicago Business, and appears on Chicago Inno's 2019 50 on Fire list, a list of the top innovators in Chicago. Jeremy Bacon co-founded Backstop Solutions, which provided back office support to hedge funds and other investment managers in 2003. In 2015, Bacon co-founded Synapse Software Labs, where he pioneered software as a service platforms in the financial services and customer relationship management markets, a relationship software company which merged with Imagineer. Fun fact, He's a musical theater junkie and performs at least once a year in a show. Jeremy, welcome to the Keep Leading Podcast. Hey there. Thanks so much for having me on the show today. I appreciate it. Well, you're a pretty impressive guy. What should my listeners know about you? Uh, I don't know. That that was a that was a pretty exhaustive list. Um, I think one thing that people usually don't know about me is that I also um, I'm an ultra marathoner and endurance athlete. I love doing adventure races and uh, that love and passion for doing ridiculous things in the mountains and in the woods uh, also led to another company that I co-founded uh, called the Forge Adventure Parks. And we build outdoor recreation parks, uh, which are pretty fabulous, you know, hundreds of acres of outdoor awesomeness. So that is, uh, I guess, one other thing I could throw into the mix. So you're just a serial entrepreneur is what I hear you saying, Jeremy. <laughs> I uh, I have been, I was bitten by the entrepreneurship bug when I was eight years old, and it has been both a blessing and a curse ever since. Eight years old. Mm-hmm. Wow. Now, that's impressive. I'm often asked, are leaders born or are they made? So it sounds like you were almost born, huh? 
Well, I think that I think the entrepreneur part of me was definitely born. Um, I think the leadership thing is something that we all learn. Uh, I think you know I, I would I would argue I guess that I probably was born with some innate leadership traits and skills and things, but I think it's through experience and honestly through a lot of effort that those traits are developed into real skills over time. At least in my case, that's been that, that that's how it's been. Okay. And I understand uh, from talking to your staff and some of the amazing work that you're doing and just the level of enthusiasm and passion that your staff has, that the, the, the culture that you've built in your organization is just phenomenal. And you have a, a phrase for the culture you've built. Can you share that with my audience? Sure. So we focus most of our efforts and most of our energy on being uh, customer centric in all things and in all in all ways. Uh, our, our culture sort of focuses on four key values, and those four key values drive that customer centric approach that we take. But we're really big believers in the idea of openness and integrity uh, and pragmatism and gratitude. Uh, in fact, most of our conversations start and stop with us talking about how grateful we are for the opportunity we have to build our products and service our clients. And that's sort of the, those values for us anyway, sort of lead us down this path to being focused on customer centricity, which we feel at the end of the day is just another way of saying having an acute, uh, always on focus on needs versus wants of our customers and, uh, and our teammates as well. Very nice. And so service centric leadership has four pillars. You said openness, integrity, gratitude. And I think I missed the fourth one. Pragmatism. Pragmatism. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So tell us a little bit, if you would, please, how you arrived at this as a leadership philosophy. Yeah. So for me, the journey was, uh, I think as with a lot of journeys, it kind of starts inside my own head and inside my own heart and sort of getting to know myself as a person. In fact, you know, when I, when I was a little kid, my dad always used to say to me that one of the most important things that I could do as a young man, as a boy, and then as a young man, is truly get to know myself. In fact, that's, he always used to say, know thyself. You have to know yourself before you can know anybody else or really be of great value to those around you. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, I didn't really understand what that meant or, or how to apply it. But as I got to know myself better, um, and got to know my own strengths and weaknesses as a person and as a leader, um, that became, I began to see the value in, in sort of focusing on that as a thing. And, you know, for me, my natural, I guess, tendencies and persona are such that I, I have this crazy passion to grow and expand and explore the world around me. And I have uh, probably too much energy, um, great need for excitement. And I'm, for better and worse, I'm constantly driven to seek bigger and better things and better is a, better can be defined in many different ways. In fact, my wife would tell you who, and my wife is my soulmate and my rock and my island. And she's stuck with me now for uh, 20 years of marriage and uh, 23 plus years as my, uh, as my partner in crime, as they say. That's outstanding. She would tell you that like, that's the thing about me that drives her the most nuts is that I'm, I'm too like crazy <laughs> in that way. But what's interesting is that um, it's through that passion that I have for sharing and for developing and building teams and growing things and designing products and working with customers and working with people that sort of helped me to see the possibilities for the future and what we can go grow and what we can go do. And then gives me the sort of the, the, the strength to rally the troops, if you will, and, and, uh, and, and help guide and lead my teammates to, to, I guess, up that mountain, if you will. And, you know, so this sort of natural tendency to drive groups toward results is something that just comes naturally to me. And uh, as is that ability and that desire to share passion and energy and to drive changes and to keep things moving at a rapid pace, it's, it's um, I think for me, it, it, it's, it, it's those things that makes it essential that I try to work in and try to create environments that are built around openness um, right. You need to be open to new ideas and new ways of thinking. And you need to be open to being wrong and being told you're wrong by your teammates bluntly <laughs> from time to time. Um, but you also have to, if you're not acting with integrity, then you can't a accept that feedback and accept that 
criticism, if you will. At the same time, if you're not pragmatic, you can't implement and build and design the kind of products and kind of experiences you're working toward. Uh, and lastly, if you don't have gratitude through all that, you can't share that thankfulness with your teammates for them being open and being pragmatic with you and forcing you to be better and forcing you to work for your client and, 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 and do things uh, in a bigger, better, more efficient way. So for me, the, the, those four principles are really tied together, um, but they also are grounding principles for me as a person who you know, is driven to, to, to run, to really sprint all the time. Um, they help keep me grounded and help keep me in place. Wonderful. Well, it sounds like you're doing an outstanding job with that. And what I love about it is not only is it authentic, but I see corporate values all the time, as I'm sure you do in the line of work Mm -hmm. you are as a CEO. But uh, this is the first time I will say that I've seen gratitude and certainly pragmatism as a part of a core value. So fantastic. Now, you say you allow your team to challenge you and they can speak openly. And that says a lot about you as a leader, because at times that's difficult for a leader. So in this openness, what are some lessons you've learned that have made you an even better leader? Yeah, thank you for asking that question, because to me, that's a super important one. Um, Like, I think some of the some of the I wasn't always sort of (laughs) self-aware. Right. So Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, you know, no, again, coming down to this notion of knowing yourself and knowing your strengths and weaknesses um, for me anyway, opened me up to being able to take that criticism. And in fact, I kind of people who work most closely with me know that I demand it. There, there are a few things that I demand, but one of the things I okay. absolutely demand and use a strong word for is you've got to tell me what you think. And you've got to tell me if you think I'm wrong. Because one of the, one of the challenges that's associated with like my type of my leadership style is that I'm, I believe in planning. I believe in deep thought and deep analysis, but I'm also oriented toward action. So I, as my teammates will say, I don't sleep much and I'm kind of always on and always wired and always thinking. So oftentimes I've thought through a problem, thought through a bunch of different variants, thought through the solutions and made a decision about what I think is the right path forward. But because I do so much of that behind the scenes or, you know, while I'm running a marathon or whatever, um, sometimes I bring those things to the, to the team and like, it's, it's all new and fresh and you know, not everyone works that way. And so I've found that in a, if, if you have an environment where your teammates can't say, hey, we're, actually, I should back up, where A, your teammates don't understand that that's how you work and that's how you're wired and therefore you can't help it. It's just who you are. And then B, don't understand that they can tell you, no, Jeremy, you're being, you're wrong and here's why. Or, hey, should we stop and think about this angle? Or did you look at this as a potential problem? Then you end up in a situation where you're setting yourself up and your teammates up for, for failure. So as a result, I demand that people are open and frank with me about how they see or perceive my thinking, my thoughts and, and, and my, my vision for, for a particular thing. And that, you know, that, that can be a little intimidating for some people. Uh, that's also why I think it's so important to be open and, and honest about that trend or that, that trait. Well, that says a lot because a uh, few people, uh, especially at the higher levels, want to be told. And uh, you say you demand it. So that's very strong. So that's, uh, and I'm sure that would catch a lot of people off guard. So no one's, no one's right all the time. Right. <laughs> so the, be, the, the best case, you're right. 51% <laughs> of the time. And so I, I grew up in the asset management industry. And although I've been building software companies that serve asset managers for a couple of decades now, like our clients are all money managers, right. And they get these men and women get paid very well to make the right investment decisions of, with regards to which securities they're going to purchase and how long they're going to own them and who they're going to back and all this stuff. And you know the the most wise and humble of all asset managers will tell you, and those that are most successful long term will tell you their entire purpose for being, their entire goal when they go into the office and look at the markets is to be right 52 to 55 percent of the time. And if they are, they will win. Uh, and the biggest and most successful fund managers in the world, that's that's their focus. How do I be right? Not 100% of the time, but 55% of the time. And that's that's how you win. And it's really interesting when you think about it that way, because traditional business isn't much different, right? No, no one ever has the best product. Um, though I should say that the group that wins rarely has the best product. The group that wins rarely has the best resources. It's how they spend those resources and how they allocate their time and energy um, that matters the most. And again, for me, that's why it comes back to it. Like, you, we got to be open. We got to talk about it. We got to work it out. And then we got to work like crazy for the good of the customer. Doesn't mean 
bending over backwards to do a bad deal or to be taken advantage of by a customer. It means being open and transparent with that client and working together to, to drive a result for them too. Okay, well, excellent. Well, we're talking to Jeremy Bacon. And what we'd like to do right now, Jeremy, is just to pause for a word from our sponsors. This podcast is sponsored by Eddie Turner, LLC. Organizations who need to accelerate the development of their leaders call Eddie Turner the Leadership Accelerator. Eddie works with leaders to accelerate performance and drive impact. Call Eddie Turner to help your leaders one-on-one as their coach or to inspire them as a group through the power of facilitation or a keynote address. Visit eddieturnerllc.com to learn more. This is Beata Kerr, head of Bernstein Private Client Core Asset Strategies, and you're listening to the Keep Leading Podcast with Eddie Turner. We're back. We're talking to Jeremy Bacon, CEO of the Imagineer Technology Group and chairman of the Illinois Technology Association. Before the break, Jeremy was telling us about his company's service-centric leadership philosophy that he's built in the four pillars it's built on and his viewpoint on leadership, leading from the top as a CEO. And then, Jeremy, you started to tell us a little bit about the type of work that you are doing. So tell us a little bit more about who Imagineer Technology Group is and who your primary audience is. Sure. So Imagineer Technology Group is a 21-year-old software company uh, that makes software services for asset management firms. And when we say asset management firms, we mean money management firms. So our clients are uh, the world's largest hedge funds and traditional asset managers, think groups like Vanguard or BlackRock, Fidelity, those types of, of, of money management firms, all the way through to private equity and venture capital firms as well. So our customers use our platforms to do a couple of pretty important things. One is they use our systems to manage their marketing and investor communications uh, and fundraising activities. So if they they use us uh, to help them manage the fundraising process, to deal with opportunity tracking, to monitor their perspective of an existing client's engagement with their websites, to do marketing services and marketing automation things for them as they're trying to raise more money and then ultimately service those investors once they've got them in their funds. So if someone comes in and invests a bunch of money, they then use our platform to send them everything from performance estimates and statements and documentation around their performance and the strategies of the funds and things like that. It's it's a pretty interesting industry. It sounds interesting, especially when you start to talk about uh, some of the biggest money market uh, or asset management firms uh, that are out there that you mentioned, such as BlackRock and others. Is there a target, is there a sweet spot that you have if someone is interested in reaching out to you for services? Is there a group that might say, "Mm, well, maybe uh, we're not big enough for his company? Well, what's interesting about the way that our platforms work is we have a series of service offerings that are uh, uniquely situated and positioned for um, everything from startup fund managers that might be two or three people in a you know in a in a in the proverbial garage somewhere working on their trading strategy and starting to raise money. Uh, we have product offerings that that are that are capable for them and that are price point perfect, if you will, for that particular side of the market. Uh, The majority of our clients are larger managers that have more experience, say they're five years, seven years, 15 years old as asset managers and have, you know, uh, anywhere from a billion to a hundred billion dollars under management on their platforms. Um, And then sort of everybody in between is is a good fit for what we do because we've been able to break the platform down uh, on a sort of feature by feature and service type by service type basis. And what's interesting is you are truly on, on the leading edge. And one of the reasons you're on the inner list of 50 on fire is because of your use of technology to supply financial solutions. Yeah, we're, that's it's all we do every day, all day. We think about how do we improve the tools that we already have and how do we think about um, creating deeper integrations between our own tools and other tools in the marketplace that our clients use to help them complete the picture and, you know, sort of further streamline their own operations and become even more efficient with how they, uh, how they build and and manage their client relationships. And I think that's interesting. And I think that's important because, you know, we started off our conversation talking about some of the soft skills that are important for leaders. Mm -hmm. But when we look at the the business acumen that you're demonstrating here and what you're doing in this leading, leading in this space, what leadership lesson is there that you could share with other leaders who are listening to our conversation? 
Well, let's see here. There's a couple of things, I guess, that come to mind immediately. Um, and they also, you know, conveniently, I suppose, relate back to our own uh, values as a business and how we try to position things. But one of the things I wish I had known, if you will, or wish I had been told as I was sort of growing and developing as a, as a business person, as an entrepreneur and as, as a leader, is that the most important thing you can do when offering a product or offering a service, whether it's your first day in the market or your 5,000th day in the market, is to uh, develop respect, mutual respect between your customer, your prospect, and yourself, your business. Everyone who talks about your company, whether they're a salesperson or a customer service representative or your CFO or your head of product or anybody in the middle, um, ultimately is a champion for and a representative of your business. And they're first and foremost, number one job should always be garnering and gaining and earning the respect of their prospective or existing customer. Because respect sort of leads to trust. And in my mind, trust leads to commitment. And to build a team or to build a customer base and to build a relationship, you need all three of those things. And as you know, right, you, you win relationships that aren't built on deep trust and deep respect um, don't last very long. Uh, it just it is the way it is. And, you know, in an industry like ours, uh, we're focused on owning our relationships with our clients forever. For as long as they're in business, we want them to be a client. And we have a very good track record of, 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 of retention of our clients. And, and in fact, generally speaking, the only reason we lose a client is if they go out of business. And I think we, we get there because of that lesson, right? Because of that, that, um, that approach. That's really interesting because not a lot of industries can say that. You truly want a customer for life. We do. It also means that we're willing to walk away from customers that we don't think are going to be a great fit. Um, and so for me, that's, and my, my sales teams will tell you, I harp on this all the time. The most important thing we can do in sales and marketing when we're qualifying and sort of working at the top of the funnel is qualify the customer. And that to do that requires real meaningful discovery and diligence. And um, if the if you if you fail to qualify your customer uh, and you you fail to prepare to service them, then you're preparing to fail them as a vendor and they're preparing to fail you as a customer. It's like the old Benjamin Franklin quote, right? If you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. Mm -hmm. Good old Ben's one of my favorite leaders of all time. And I think that that, you know, that truism, if you will, uh, certainly applies in, in our world and what we do. You know, it's far easier to, to service an existing client than to get a new one. So when you are getting new ones, you, you owe it to yourself and to your clients to pick the right ones. Absolutely. So do you have any uh, heroes or people who you look up to in the leadership space as a CEO? Oftentimes um, it can be a lonely place. Mm -hmm. Who do yeah, you look sure. up to? Yeah, so there, there are lots of entrepreneurs, um, women and men alike, who are sort of of the modern era that I respect and look up to and, and follow. But to be honest, I spend more time um, looking at leaders of the past uh, than I do at leaders of today. And mostly that's because most of us who are in leadership roles today, like we all learned it from somewhere. This is a bit of a sidebar, but um, <laughs> I've been a musician and, and singer and stuff and performer my whole life. And uh, one of my favorite musician of all time, probably, or one of is, is Robert Plant, uh, the original lead singer for, for Led Zeppelin. But he has always been famous for saying that we all nick it from somewhere, right? We all learn <laughs> and we all, we all steal our ideas from others, from those who've come before us, whether it's musical or it's, you know, it's, it's anything else. So the, the person I go back to the most, honestly, is, is Benjamin Franklin. To me, he was, although he's, he's not always thought of as a leader of men and women, he's thought of as an innovative idea thinker and an entrepreneur in his own right. But um, I think he's actually often underlooked uh, or, or underappreciated as a, as a leader. Um, and in addition to, you know, truisms like uh, if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail that he's, he's known for. I think one of the things that I really respect about um, his approach and one of the quotes I often go back to with my own children is, you know, he said, um, if you tell me, I will forget. Um, if you teach me, I will remember. And if you involve me, I will learn. And, you know, that to me is, has always sort of been a, a, a powerful, I remember reading it the first time in, in the art of virtue, which is, yeah, that's book. one of my favorites. Love yes. that book. It's on my desk at home. I, I refer to it literally every week. Um, and I read that as a kid and I was, it blew me away. Um, I thought, wow, that's really cool. It's really neat. And of course he nicked it from, you know, some Chinese philosophy, the whole, if you teach man to fish thing, but like, it's really neat. Right. Um, and to me, it, to me, it's, it, it's really cool. So I, I like Ben. He's a good dude. Excellent. I, yeah. I also like my mom. And so the other person that I think about all the time as it relates, particularly as it relates to sort of 
um, service centric leadership is is my own mother. She led by example through her whole life and was always focused on service. And in fact, there was uh, one one day she sat me down when I was I had just turned fifteen, and she said to me, um, we were we were talking about you know how to how to live a life that you will feel is rich and fulfilling and rewarding, and and how to get through you know good times and bad alike. And she basically said, look, the most important thing you can do from her perspective is, you know, to fill your heart with love and admiration and, and go out and serve others. And that, you know, what, what's truly important is how we live, serve and love others today uh, in the now. And as a person, because I'm, I tend to be focused on tomorrow and next week and next year, because I'm always thinking about the next thing, that has always been really grounding for me to, again, remind me to stay in the now in as much as possible, um, to be present and to, you know, to, to, to lead in the moment and to lead with the teams that I'm with, because I spend a lot of time in the clouds. You're wonderful. So, Jeremy, tell me, if you would, how would you summarize our conversation today? Um, I guess I would summarize our conversation by saying that in the world of entrepreneurship and business development and leadership, from my perspective, the most important thing we can do is to keep the customer, keep your teammate, and keep your values at the center. Uh, And doing so ultimately, I think, and I've found leads to greater success for, for you as an individual and for your team uh, as a as a business group and ultimately for your client as well. All right. Very good. And on the Keep Leading podcast, we like to give leaders something that helps them to keep leading. Do you have a piece of leadership advice? You've given us several great quotes throughout this interview. Uh, do you have any other quotes or any other advice you've received that helps you lead as a leader? Yeah, there's one other piece that comes to mind um, all the time, and that is mostly because of the power of the message and the the power of the person who delivered it to me. But without boring you with all the details, I think the best advice I got uh, as a 17-year-old was from George Bush Sr. I was at the White House, and he and I were having a conversation. And during that conversation, he said something to me that also lives in my mind every day, all day. And then he said, look, It's not enough in life to know what your goal is and what you want. You have to understand why you want it and the true why behind that goal or accomplishing it is meaningless. And that to me was, as a kid going into my senior in high school, was mind blowing to say the least. Well, I bet that's quite an experience to be 17 years old in the White House and be able to talk to an American president. And uh, you may not know this, but I'm based here in Houston, Texas. And so he is truly a legend. Uh, (laughs) And so, yes, uh, George Bush. So excellent. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. I just have really enjoyed talking with you. Where can my listeners learn more about you and your organization? Sure. So ImagineerTechnology.com is how to find our company. And I'm on the internet on LinkedIn. Excellent. So what we're going to do is in the show notes, we're going to put links to you and your organization. We want folks to reach out to the Imagineer Technology Group, connect with you on LinkedIn, follow you on Twitter, and uh, get to know you and your team are doing some really amazing things. Well, thank you for saying that. We appreciate that. We're certainly trying real hard. Well, it's been a pleasure to have you, and uh, we'll have to catch up and talk again next time I'm in Chicago. Sounds good. I'd love that. That concludes this episode, everyone. I'm Eddie Turner, the Leadership Accelerator, reminding you that leadership is not about our title or our position. Leadership is an activity. Leadership is action. It's not the case of once a leader, always a leader. It's not a garment we put on and take off. We must be a leader at our core and allow it to emanate in all we do. So whatever you're doing, always keep leading. Thank you for listening to your host, Eddie Turner, on the Keep Leading Podcast. Please remember to subscribe to the Keep Leading Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen. For more information about Eddie Turner's work, please visit eddieturnerllc.com. Thank you for listening to C-Suite Radio, turning the volume up on business.